we'll, we'll get, hello? Why would anything ever work around here? I know. Hello, hello. Ooh, it works. Um, we're going to get started in about two minutes. By way of introduction, first, I'm Bob Lurlacher, the town manager. Uh, Superintendent Dr. John Doherty is to my left. There's members both of the school committee and the board of selectmen to John's left, and there's members of the finance committee to my, left, uh, to my right. Um, I have a presentation that got a little longer after the finance committee meeting last night. Um, I hope to be done in about 20 minutes. Um, it's a good idea for you to stop me and ask questions if you have them right then and there. It really is. Uh, Dr. Doherty will then make a few remarks, and I'll come back to follow up with a few remarks. And then it's open season for question and answer. Um, from the past meetings we've had, um, especially this spring, it's the questions and answers that are the more interesting part of the meeting, quite honestly. But I've heard from a lot of you that the presentations have been helpful to give a framework, so that's what we hope to do. Can I just briefly call the Finance Committee sure. to order. Uh, I'll put this up on the website early next week, yes. Um, as you can see, the next steps in our uh, long process uh, is, aside from tonight, on September 12th, those in the room that are town meeting members, there's a special town meeting. The warrant's been available in the police station for a little while. And then on Tuesday, October 18th, there will be a special election. Technically, the Board of Selectmen have not formally called for that. They'll do that Tuesday night uh, next week. To just take you through some, again, this is an overview. Uh, in the current fiscal year, we have about $90 million of revenues. The first thing we do with our revenues is take care of something called accommodated costs, about $33 million in the current year. Uh, there are things that, generally speaking, are somewhat out of the control of the town. Uh, things like benefits, capital, debt, energy, and you, you can see the list and so forth. Whatever's left over, we split currently approximately 6436 between the schools and the town, and we refer to those as the operating budgets. Now, for both the school and the town, some of those costs that are called accommodated costs are items that are also part of their budgets. So the school budget, the school committee and the superintendent and ultimately school department budget, has both types of these costs in there. For instance, you can see out of district special education, and that's part of a school budget. But just to get, to get at how we operate, uh, again, this is how you get to the operating budgets. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> to give you a little history and a little flavor for how this has worked, you can see the histories of revenues. Whoops. Don't point the wrong one. I'm very dangerous with some technology. There's revenues. So you can see revenues have generally been a little below 3% uh, for the last several years, 2.5% on average for the last six years. Forecast a little bit better in the next year and following years. Um, these accommodated costs in the last several years have behaved very well, uh, but not on their own, as, as I'll get to. We've had to do a lot of things to make that happen. Um, so historically, recently, 2.5% revenues, 1.8% accommodated costs, and that has meant operating budgets can grow faster than the revenues, 2.7%. You can see that in several of the years, it's been about 3.5%. Um, FY12 was a particularly bad year, and the reason we're here tonight is FY18 is forecast as being even worse than FY12 was. Despite the fact that in many of these years, our operating budgets were about 3.5%, there's been a lot of warning signs. So town meeting members know we've talked about this uh, for several years to the point where I'm sure no one really listens to me anymore. It's going to happen, I keep saying. Um, we've, FinCom in the last two years has modestly cut the capital that we've done by a couple hundred thousand in order that the operating budgets might get some of that money. Uh, we've had to use increasing amounts of free cash to balance the budget. 
That just means in addition to the revenues I showed you, we have a savings account, much like the state <laughs> has done recently. They use one-time rainy day funds to balance an operating budget, which is never a good idea. In the last year, we used uh, 2.15 million of our savings account to balance our operating budgets. And despite this increased use of free cash, a reduction in capital, we've still had to eliminate some positions. To look forward, uh, in next year, FY18, which is start next July, it, it appears that that $2.15 million structural deficit is going to grow to $3 million. And I'll get back to that. It's not surprising. If our objective is a 3.5% operating budget growth, which we saw was modest, uh, it doesn't mean it avoids layoffs, but it's reasonable, um, you know, how do we accomplish that? And right now, that $3 million uh, forecast for next summer is about a two and one million dollar shortfall in the school budget and the town budget. We're approximately two thirds, one third. This this looks forward. Uh, in one year, the gap doesn't look too large. In eight years, it starts to look quite large. Um, this is just an index, so it's not a number. But what it's telling you is, accommodated costs, which are the red line, are growing at a faster rate than revenues and a faster rate than the operating budgets. You can't even tell the difference between revenues and operating budgets. They're, the, they're almost the same. So the problem with our revenues is they don't support these accommodated costs. And every year that goes by, we're forecast to dip another $700,000 into the red. So that's the primary reason why we've gone from a 2.15 deficit to a $3 million deficit next summer. If that continues for eight years, 700,000 times eight is 5.6 million. So to solve a $5.6 million deficit eight years from now, um, you would have to, again, by state law, an override is a lump sum, not a percent. And I'm going to get back to Prop 2.5 and, and give you a good explanation. But you saw by this picture right here, um, a lump sum doesn't solve that gap. A percentage increase in your revenues would, but a lump sum cannot. But a lump sum is the only tool we have. So a lump sum is that red line in the middle, and what it says is, for the first four years you saved money, and the last four years you're going to need to spend it. And that all works out mathematically, so this $5.6 million structural deficit goes away. The problem is, in year nine, you're left with a huge problem. You're left with a huge hole. Um, you're left with, instead of a $3 million structural deficit, it's almost a $6 million structural deficit. But we do have a cure for that. Ten years ago, and I, I will come back to this, um, we had a real struggle with doing capital in town. We were not doing a particularly good job at all, and there were reasons for that. In the last ten years, we've done an excellent job. For the next five years, our capital plan is, is forecast as balanced against available revenues that are set aside for capital, which is 5% of our revenues. In years 6 through 10, we have a surplus. We can't spend the money that's allocated to capital, try as we might. Seems hard to believe. Uh, but we've looked over all the equipment, we've looked over the buildings, and except for a couple of large projects, which I'll also come back to, we clearly have a surplus in capital. Um, so what, what I'll propose later, just as a minor point, is let's spend a little more money on capital up front and let's spend a little less later on, and that'll swing the seesaw a little bit so you're not left with as big a gap at the end. Instead of a $5.6 million gap, it'll, it'll just be a million or two. But the basic message is um, operating budgets are rather uh, funding gaps that grow each year cannot be solved by someone writing you a check. You know, if we had, uh, instead of 2.5% growth every year, we had 3% or 3.5%, it would be fine. And let me come back to that thought. Um, <clears throat> first, in the listening sessions, uh, some folks came up and thought it was very helpful for us to discuss Reading in the context of other communities. So we have, uh, as derived by two different uh, consultants, 25 peer communities. I don't remember all the math, but there was eight or nine variables they used, plus an important one was form a government. So you can see right in the middle there, there's a hole next to us. Uh, that's Woburn, because they're a city. 
So cities are not considered peer governments, apparently because mayors do things differently. I, I don't know why. Um, our peers, as a group, have 66, almost 67 percent of their revenue uh, reliant on the tax levy. We only have 60 percent, so that's a big difference between us and our peers. An even bigger difference is the residential commercial split. Uh, peers are roughly three, three quarters, one quarter, three quarters residential. We're over 90 percent residential. We produce about the same tax revenue from the residential sector. We each produce about 54 million. But our peers, on average, produce 12 million more in revenue than we do from the commercial, industrial, personal property sector. So there right now is, is a huge difference between Reading and the typical peer communities. Some of the peers look a lot like Reading, but in aggregate, they don't in this regard. We have to make up the revenue somewhere, so we're much more reliant on state aid. We're much more reliant on local fees and local receipts, and some of that is an RMLD dividend. <clears throat> this is how we spend money. You just saw how we got money. This is how we spend it. Um, really, there's nothing on this page that's particularly interesting and says you do something very different than the peer communities. We spend a little bit more on some of the things at the top of the chart and a little bit less on the things at the bottom of the chart. But I do want to come back to um, education because right there we spend a little bit more on education and yet we spend quite a bit less per pupil. And those two things are both true. We have a lot of kids. Um, if you look at this chart and you look at that column that says percent enrollment, that's the percent of the population that's enrolled in public schools in 2014-15. So 17.4 percent of our population was enrolled in uh, one of the public schools. You know, contrast that with Stoneham at the bottom of the page there. They have only 10.7 percent students. They have a lot more apartments, for instance. Um, the cost of running a town is greatly determined by this chart. The more students you have, the more expensive the community is to, uh, to run. So Reading is well above average in terms of the amount of students uh, in the community. And that's why, although we spend about an average amount on education, we have a lot more students. So per pupil, we do not spend an average amount. We're well below average. I want to step back and talk a little about an override. In 1980, uh, some residents got together and filed what's called initiative petition. It was passed and then implemented two years later. And it limited the property tax that a community can charge to grow by 2.5% per year, plus new growth. If all our houses and all the commercial property stayed assessed the exact same way in the next year, we'd all go up 2.5%. But that's not how it works. Assessed values always change. So individual bills go up more and less than 2.5%, but as a community, we're capped at 2.5%. I might add that health insurance at the time, the inflation rate there was 1%. An override seeks to permanently increase the tax levy by a certain dollar amount. And once that happens, if it happens, from then on, that new dollar amount may go up 2.5% a year. I'll show you this with a picture. It's important to note that capital or debt exclusions, and Reading has one for the high school and one for the library, um, are not permanent increases in taxes. Uh, they, they are added on top of the 2.5% levy. They are excluded from that cap, and those can only happen when the voters approve it. They are for a specified period of time and a specified dollar amount. This is what uh, your current average single family home tax bill looks like. In Reading, the average single family home is $499,500 assessed value. It pays $7,250 tax bill. 161 of that is to finish paying for the high school. That'll be done after FY24. $184 is to pay off for the library, and that'll be done in after FY25. So you can see that from the table below, if nothing else changed, this is what the tax bill would do for the next 10 years. It would go up by 2.3 percent. That's the 2.5 percent, but the high school and the library debt do not increase each year. They actually, one of them decreases, one of them stays the same. So it's less than 2.5 percent. In FY25 and 6, you can see that first the high school and then the library projects go away. 
And from then on, all you'd have left is the tax levy, uh, and that would go up 2.5%. So that's how your tax bill would look if nothing else happened for the next 10 years. And for what it's worth, that works out to be a 2% increase in the tax bill annually over 10 years. In looking at our peers and their override behavior, um, this, this is a list of the 25 plus Reading. It's a bit of a busy chart, but once I'm finished, it, it's quite simple. It's sorted by residential percent. So you see Milton, where I grew up, is 96% residential. They have very little uh, commercial and, and business. Winchester, 95, down to Reading, 91. At the other extreme, Burlington, no surprise, 62% residential. So the sort order is residential, and there's a reason for that. Reading has asked since Prop 2.5 began five times for an override. You can see that column that says Reading total five. The most recent request from Reading was in 2003 when it was approved. The most recent yes was the same, April of 2003. Anything in yellow is a community that has either asked more often than Reading, has had a more recent request than Reading, or a more recent yes request than Reading. And you can see, it's quite obvious, the communities on the left, um, the bedroom communities, if you will, the ones that are more residential, need to ask more often because they do not have the commercial tax base. Um, some of the communities on the right-hand side have, have still a fair amount, Wilmington's a great example, a fair amount of open space, and they are targeting commercial for that. So as long as there's more new tax revenues coming in, you don't need to raise the old ones. As you look around Reading, obviously, we don't have a lot of that opportunity. So most of the peers that are like us have asked far more often and have had recent, almost every one of them has asked more recently. And all but Stoneham has had a successful override since Reading last did. And recall that Stoneham does not have nearly as many students to, ed to educate. So the point of this slide is to show that it's not unusual that Reading's coming back and asking for an override. It's what municipal governments do. In 2003, voters approved a four and a half million dollar override. Uh, using today's uh, tax base as a, as a guide, that would be an eight and a half million dollar override now. Um, I'm sure many of you know the selectmen have recently indicated a seven and a half million dollar override is what they'd be interested in. So that's somewhat modest relative to the last time we asked. <clears throat> when this was approved, I was actually on the Finance Committee, um, most of the money was spent right away or um, within a year. There was no financial modeling that looked to the future, and that's how we've spent our last several months, is looking to the future. There was a statement in one of the meeting minutes by someone that said, I hope this will last for eight to ten years. That was as much work as they did in the actual forecasting. And I, I have to say, at the time, the uh, financial system was older than any dump truck we had, so I'm not blaming anyone. But it certainly leaves the question of why did the last override last for so long? Um, <clears throat> I won't spend a lot of time on this slide, but there's a lot of reasons. Um, one of the things that we've done uh, as a group up front is we've spent money in order to save it. Maybe one of the best examples is performance contracting, which is uh, energy improvements made um, in order to save operating costs. So town meeting several years ago actually approved a lump sum um, of several million dollars in order to save money down the road in the future. Uh, very few, in fact, we're the only community in Massachusetts that I know of that's done it this way. Uh, most communities just package um, <clears throat> the savings and the cost together and don't show anyone and they just kind of make out by saying, you know, we'll do a lease. We don't ever have to go to the public. They don't have to see it. Uh, and they don't get nearly as good of a bang for the buck in savings as we did. We went right to town meeting, ex explained it all in town meeting. I'll give them a lot of credit. Said, that's a great idea. Let's borrow money and do it. And we did, um, I think it was a 12-year break even. So anything that would pay for itself in 12 years, we thought was a good idea. Uh, we're saving hundreds of thousands of dollars a year now in energy compared to where we would have been if we had not done these. Um, another one that uh, Dr. Doherty is doing is continuing to identify students who will, who will do well in the district 
and bringing them in and saving money uh, as, a, as an aside. And that's, I know, one of the reasons the schools continue to need more space. <clears throat> we actually pay some of our employees to opt out of health insurance. I personally don't like this. It's like paying a farmer not to grow corn, but it works. Um, our employees get 25% of the savings and the town gets 75% of the savings. So when an employee has a spouse that is eligible to have health insurance, if they meet certain criteria where they've been on our health insurance for a number of years, we let them opt out and pay them. <clears throat> We've also spent money to generate revenues. Uh, the best example is really the advanced life support in the fire department. Uh, on a previous slide, we, we showed you that uh, our public safety spends a little more than average community. The fire department brings in a, about $800,000 of revenue that goes to both the schools and the town. Um, it costs not nearly as much as $800,000 to run that service. We've made a lot of operational efficiency changes. Um, I'll come back to capital spending. Rubbish and recycling was a model for the state. We've done a really nice job with technology. Uh, both Dr. Dory and I have had to do a lot of restructuring with, with positions and with departments to make ourselves more efficient. I'll also come back to financial planning. But to be fair, instead of raising taxes, we've raised fees. So there is a lot more fees than there was 13 or 14 years ago for those that use a service. Uh, frankly, on that list I just went over, looking forward, we're running out of ideas, which is why we're here tonight. This is just one example of good financial planning. In FY17, our debt budget, ex never mind the uh, high school and the library, but inside the tax levy, we have a $1.8 million budget for debt. Most of that's paying down principal. Uh, if you look back to FY06, we spent 6.8% on debt service, a lot more than 2.1% that we do now. Much of it was on interest. The way I look at it is, is principal is productive because you got something for it, you built something, you bought, you bought something. Interest is very unproductive. It's the penalty for borrowing money that you didn't have. Um, look back in FY06, we paid a million six on interest. Now we pay 300,000. Surely some of that is lower interest rates, but that's not the most of the story. If FY06 practices were in place today, uh, Dr. Doherty and I would have $4 million in less in the current budgets that we have. So that's a small change made 10 years ago, but has a huge impact. And there are a number of stories like this, and that's why we've been able to go for 13 years. Um, you know, had we been using policies that were in place uh, several years ago, we would not have lasted that long. <clears throat> so the fundamental situation is our structural deficit is six million dollars. Should we ask for more? That's something the school committee and the selectmen discussed uh, at several meetings. Each, each of us met seven times uh, over the summer, which is a lot more than usual. And uh, we both came up with lists of requests. The schools came up with almost two million dollars. The town came up with a little more than a million dollars. So the uh, override menu, if you will, for the selectmen was something between six million and nine million. This is what the selectmen looked at in terms of what it would cost a typical single family home. If you look at that middle section again, that $500,000 home is the average home in Reading. A six million dollar override would cost $660 more than taxes would normally go up and a $9 million override would cost almost $1,000 more than, than taxes would normally go up. And you can see, obviously, with a higher or lower assessed value house, there's different impacts. What the selectmen chose was a number that, I was gonna say in the middle, it's a little more to the left of the middle, seven and a half million. So it does not fund all the requests that the towns and the school had at nine million, certainly, but it does do some of them. Um, that will cost the average homeowner just over $800 more than they would have otherwise been paying with no override. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the, the two endpoints, if you will, a $6 million override is almost a 3% annual increase. Recall that that chart I showed you before was a 2% annual increase, and a $9 million is 3.4% increase. 
So again, the override is a big jump in the first year, and then after that, it's that back to that 2.3, 2.4, Here's what that same tax bill would look like with a $7.5 million override. And there's the big jump in the first year, the $800 more than it would have gone up. And then you can see the 2.3s, you know, the, the, the library and the high school are repaid, so it drops down, and then you go to 2.5% after that. So that's a little more than a 3% increase over the 10 years. <clears throat> this is what Reading looks against those peers for median and family income on the bottom and fa single family home property taxes on the left. Uh, I have to admit this one surprised me. Um, depending on if you take an average or if you look at a line of regression, Reading is uh, six to $700 below our peers. Um, I pay taxes too, and I'm surprised. It didn't seem low to me. Um, as an example, uh, North Reading is right here. <clears throat> so it was interesting to, to do this calculation and see that some towns that are pretty identifiable by, by high median family incomes, and it was no surprise their property taxes were higher. Um, but it was surprising that the Reading was below average. And last night, a finance committee asked if we eliminated the highest three towns, does this story change? And the answer is it does a little. Instead of being six or 700 below peers, it's five to 600 below peers. So we're still some amount below our peer communities. Um, if you add an $800 cost onto that, we're then gonna be slightly above average, but certainly not sub substantially out of line. Um, the financial model that we've built to do this work uh, will allow us to continuously, literally, not just every year, but continuously monitor what's happening. Um, we will know statistically uh, what shape we're in. We've always known sort of by God instinct in the past few years, but we've never had a model. Uh, now we'll be able to track. So if we're, we're telling you that a $6 million structural deficit override will last eight years, as often as we need to, we can look at it and tell you whether we're on track. And I can 99% I can guarantee you it lasts at least eight years. It should last longer. But it's really important to point out there are at least two projects, and, and so far I only know of two projects, that I don't think can be financed inside the tax levy. Uh, Killam School is in need of repair. Uh, we know the state, the MSBA, is out looking at it. We'd like to do the repair when we get uh, matched funds from the state. And we also have a DPW garage slash cemetery building project uh, that we know needs uh, replacing and repairs. And in a perfect world, we'd wait till the high school and the library are repaid before we did those, but who knows exactly what we'll do. But I, I do want to caution that this override is not meant to pay for those two projects. What happened if you go back to that example of all the debt we used to have? When we, uh, when we did Barrows and Wood End, we paid for those inside the tax levy. We made a promise to the taxpayers, don't worry about it, we'll handle this. We did handle it and we wasted a lot of money on debt. You know, we, we hurt our operating budget and we severely hurt our capital plan. We don't wanna go back to that model. Uh, FinCom has a policy they adopted in 06 that said projects of a certain size must be sent to the voters. We cannot afford to do them inside the tax levy. It's, it's also important to know that the town is engaged in some efforts to try to get more revenue into this town, particularly through the commercial sector. It's not easy. If you drive around town, show me a big chunk of undeveloped land and I'll be happy to go develop it. There's not much. It's hard. I know Dr. Doherty's looked for schools. Um, there is, however, some land down by Walker's Brook that I'll come back to. Uh, this is a look at our commercial taxpayers. Um, by assessed value grouping, uh, under half a million, up to a million, and so forth, the amount of properties in each class and what percent of total properties are in that class. So if you look, 71% of our commercial property tax payers are valued at $1 million or less. They kind of look like a single family home. Um, some are very large, 9% are 3 million and up. The very large ones pay the most of 
of the commercial sec sector tax. Um, that 10 million plus is all Walker's Brook, and then the three to 10 million, five out of the 12 are Walker's Brook, so almost half. So Walker's Brook is adding 2 million, almost 2 million out of the 4.4 million in this sector. <clears throat> if we can imagine in our wildest dreams having another Walker's Brook, that's only gonna add $2 million a year. And there's nothing wrong with the only, but it doesn't solve a six or a seven and a half million dollar problem. So if we can do things like this, it would be great. And we're certainly working hard to do it. We met with someone today. Um, but this will just extend the life of an override of how useful it'll be for. Um, it will not take the place of the need for one. As an aside, I also want to talk a little bit tonight about the senior tax relief. Um, this is uh, four articles going to town meeting on September 12th. Um, I'll really just focus on the significant one, if you will, the fourth one. For those residents that qualify for Massachusetts Schedule CB, which is circuit breaker, and have owned property for at least the last 10 years in Reading, and who pay over 10% of their income in property taxes plus half of the water sewer bills. They will be eligible for a tax break if this passes the uh, local town meeting and then passes the House, the Senate, and the governor signs it this winter. It could take effect next July. So these are the different hurdles the town meeting will be discussing in another 10 days or so. <clears throat> for the average filer, um, we don't have a lot of data for this, but we do know um, the average uh, circuit breaker reduction was 850 odd dollars for 2014. So the selectmen have set a somewhat broad policy because we have not, not great data. And the target would be um, 700 to 1,000 dollar property tax reduction for the seniors that qualify. I should also add there are qualifications for the CB schedule. I won't get into those tonight, but there are age and income um, qualifications. We know that 640 people in Reading in 2014 filed that schedule. They were eligible. What we don't know is how many of them rent property, how many of them have not owned a home for 10 years or more, and how many of them don't pay more than 10% to their uh, tax bill. We only have two other communities to look at who have done programs like this, um, Sudbury and uh, Weston, uh, Wayland rather. And in those examples for what it's worth, about half the seniors that, fi that filed Schedule CB in those communities were eligible for similar programs. So perhaps 300, 350 seniors in this town will be eligible for anywhere from 700 to $1,000 of a tax benefit. This is who will pay for that benefit. Uh, both the residential and commercial sectors will share the burden. The residential sector, you can see that most homes in Reading, 60% are four or $500,000 values, assessed values. And those will pay 60 to $80 a year extra for this uh, senior tax relief. The commercial sector, again, 70% are a million or less. They'll pay 60 to $150. People with higher and lower assessed values you know, pay commensurately more or less. Um, this is distinct and separate from an override but it was important to be brought up in the same time frame because the selectmen wanted very much, as I do, to be, protect the most needy seniors from the impact of an override. There had been some discussion uh, in the spring of linking the two, and the selectmen, I'll give them a lot of credit, felt that that was buying votes, and they did not want to do that. They said if this, if this senior tax relief is the right thing for Reading, let town meeting decide that all on its own. If the override is right for Reading, let the voters decide that all on their own. Um, you know, no, no linking. At this point, I'll turn it over to Dr. Doherty to go over uh, the impacts of a yes or no override on the schools, and I'll follow up with the same on the town. Thank you, Bob. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming um, and getting as much information as possible uh, on this important topic. What, what I'm going to do and, and then the town manager will do is talk a little bit about um, 
what will happen if an override is successful from each of our perspectives and what the impact could be if the override is not uh, successful and, and, um, and does not pass. So for several months, uh, we have been talking to parents, teachers, staff, community about the challenges, um, and been, we've been looking at our own uh, data, school data, district data, and the challenges have been facing our school district over the next few years. And these are, these are challenges that a lot of school districts face, um, but there are areas that we feel that we need to address, and we, we've been uh, doing our best to address with the resources that we have available. Uh, retaining and attracting staff is a very important one. Um, we are finding more and more that uh, we are not as able to um, attract the top candidates when we have openings, and we are also finding that we are um, having difficulty retaining uh, current teachers and administrators in, um, in certain roles and positions. And we have uh, some anecdotal data that, that has shown that. Uh, this summer, which is the normal hiring period for, for, um, for schools, um, we have had situations where people have been offered positions in our district and have declined to go to another school district nearby with, for uh, higher, higher salary and benefits um, for the same exact position. Um, also, we have, there's been situations, again, this summer where we had a, have had staff members leave the district to go to another district and get a substantial increase, again, for the same position that they have. Another challenge that we're facing, uh, um, developing well-balanced and prepared students. Uh, as you may or may not know, education uh, in this country is going through a significant amount of changes, uh, curriculum changes, assessment changes, uh, new state testing system is gonna begin um, this spring. Um, and so we need to make sure that uh, we support our teachers and um, our administrators and give them the supports they need, but also make sure that our students have the supports that they need, both from an academic standpoint, but also from a uh, social and an emotional standpoint. Um, and so those, those challenges are challenges two and three. Um, number four is, is um, town manager Lelisher talked about is I'm continuing to improve our special education programs and services. Um, it's always our goal to uh, provide those services in our school district with uh, like peers, and, and students are, are with, their, with their peers in our school district. Um, and to do that, you need to have strong in-district programs. You need to have educational space to be able to do that. You need to have the training and the resources necessary to do that. Um, when you look long-term, from a financial standpoint, um, it is always financially more feasible to have students stay in district than to go to an out of district private placement. Um, there is an additional transportation cost as well as a tuition cost to that. Um, so that, that challenge is always there that we're, we're trying to do uh, a better job at. Space is something that we have been struggling with uh, for the last few years and, and it is tied into more program improvement um, in program additions than it is for enrollment. Uh, our enrollment stayed pretty steady um, in our community for the last several years, uh, somewhere between a half to a percent growth over time. Um, but where, where our, our space needs usually are is when we have, um, when we're making changes to programs and we're adding programs, particularly special education. Um, full day kindergarten is becoming much more attractive option for our families this year. Uh, over the last several years, 75% of our families uh, this year are in full day kindergarten uh, at, at, at that age. Um, and these, all these things require space. And then the last challenge, which really is the first five, if you're doing the first five really well, number six is, is something that's going, you have a better chance of happening, is making sure you're remaining comparable and competitive with area schools, um, both uh, from a staff perspective and making sure you, you uh, retain and attract staff, but also for our students and making sure that we do everything we can to keep our, you know, our students in, in uh, the Reading Public Schools. So as we have developed these challenges and we've looked at these challenges, um, we came up with a prioritized list based on the 
funding that was going to be uh, available if an override does pass uh, in October. Um, and as you saw from the, the town manager's slide, the school department would receive um, $2,960,000 from um, an, an override ballot question if it was successful. So to address the challenges that I just referred to, um, we, uh, a list has been created and discussed uh, several times um, over, over several meetings uh, by the school committee and the community. And um, I have this list now in front of me. I'm going to go briefly over each one of them. The first piece is the $2 million structural deficit piece that Bob talked about. Um, this is to allow for us to continue to do what we're doing this year in FY18 with the normal um, increases that we've experienced over time um, in transportation, special education, um, contractual salary increases. Um, that's where that structural deficit um, comes from. Salary adjustments is something that I mentioned earlier about retaining and attracting staff. Um, one of the things that we have done is to take a look at the salary schedules of the comparable communities that, that Bob talked about. Um, and it's very clear from looking at those salary schedules that Reading is in the bottom half of those 25, 26 communities. So it is something that we feel is important so that we can continue to retain the staff um, that we have and to attract staff when openings uh, become available. We also have other items on this list that at, t at one time we did have in the school district, but over time due to um, limited resources, we've had to cut or restructure in other ways. Curriculum leadership is something that uh, is a, would be extremely important um, for, our, for our staff and for our administrators in terms of improving student learning. Uh, currently, the, most of our principals have a supervisory caseload in terms of the amount of staff that they supervise of 40 to 50 staff. And to be able to run a school and also supervise staff, give them the feedback that they need to be effective teachers in the classroom, um, 40 to 50 is just too many. So what this will allow us to do is it will allow us to give more feedback and supervise staff um, to help them succeed, which then directly affects students, but also at the same time to be able to align our curriculum um, in all of our subject areas from K all the way, pre-K all the way up to 12th grade, um, so that what is happening in one classroom at a grade level is connected to what's happening in the next grade in that subject area and also across the same grade level. In addition, we have some items here that help support students who may be struggling from an academic standpoint. Um, when, when students are not accessing the curriculum and they are not in special education, we do not have a, a lot of available supports to help them. Um, and so we have on this list some uh, academic tutors and also to help students that may be struggling uh, behaviorally or social emotionally, uh, we have what is called a board certified behavior analyst to help support teachers to be able to help classroom teachers and give them the skills that they need to help support those students. I also um, talked about uh, curriculum supervision leadership, but special education leadership is also um, an important piece of this. And having some additional curriculum uh, special education leadership uh, will allow us to continue to strengthen the special education programs that I mentioned earlier um, so that, again, we can continue to keep students that are on individualized education plans for special education in our district. Another area of importance that we, we did have at one time was middle school health education. Uh, we had to reduce that uh, and eliminate middle school health education out of the budget in 2013. Um, the staffing that's, that's listed here would give us the opportunity to have health education at our middle school um, in semester-based courses across the grades and to be able to connect that curriculum um, at a very delicate and difficult time in a, in a child's uh, developmental life and adolescence um, with 
than with the high school health curriculum that we have. And we just started introducing this year some lessons at elementary level. So we're beginning to put together a comprehensive health education program if, if we're able to uh, have this funded. We also uh, need to do some additional uh, work at our high school. And so the, uh, the amount of uh, funding here would, would be for some teachers so that we can improve our course offerings in advanced placement and electives, which would allow all students to get more access to different courses and help uh, get them uh, more prepared for college and career uh, readiness and also for other skills and trades that they may want to do after high school. And then the, the last piece, which is not uh, any funding that's needed, uh, is a data analyst and administrator for social emotional learning, and that's currently being funded out of our school transformation grant, which we received two years ago. Um, this is being funded through FY19. But the committee felt it was important to list it because these two positions are extremely important in uh, helping support our teachers and our administrators in uh, helping students um, learn. So that's where the, the funding amount comes from that, um, that would happen if the ballot question was approved. Now what happens if the override does not pass? Um, we talked about that $2 million, structural, uh, $2 million structural deficit, and that would be approximately the amount that we would need to reduce from the school department budget. So one of the questions that's been asked to us in the past is, well, why can't you just reduce expenses without reducing staff? Uh, there's a couple of reasons for this. For the last three years, uh, the school department has been reducing their budget. It's been a combination of personnel and non-personnel expenses. Um, up until this current year, it had been mostly non-personnel expenses. Unfortunately, in the current fiscal year, FY17, the 2016-17 school year, we had to cut 7.3 positions, 6.3 of those were classroom teachers. So we're at a point now, um, as similar to what the town manager said, is that we are running out of ways um, to make uh, the services that we provide more efficient, um, to be able to restructure the things that we're doing to make it more effective. Um, and the expenses that we have, um, we can make some reductions, um, and I'm going to show you that in a, in, in a second. Um, but most of them are things that are required, either by law or things that we need in order to run the school district. Uh, so for example, um, we have in our school department budget, as you can see, most of it is wages. Expenses are about $7 million uh, out of a $42, $43 million budget. If you break it down by the five cost centers that you see there, and these, this is in millions, um, in each of the cost centers you have in parentheses. So for example, in administration, you have a legal budget, an audit budget, which is required by law, employee physicals, which is required uh, when we're hiring new employees. Um, in the regular day, which is where all the teaching and learning um, budget areas, you have your text and materials and supplies and classroom technology. Some reductions could be made there. You're going to see that in the next slide. Special education, a lot of it is required and mandated by law, uh, and it's tied into a child's individual education program. Um, so things like transportation, out-of-district tuition, which are all expenses, are things that we would not be able to cut or reduce. School facilities, um, really the, uh, the area that's in this budget that would be expenses is the cleaning contract that we have here at the high school and our cleaning and custodian supplies. So those are things that uh, would be difficult to cut. And then uh, district-wide programs, um, very, very small budget. You're talking about your health and nursing services, which is your medical supplies, extracurricular and athletics, which also we charge a user fee for. Um, and our technology infrastructure. So there is not a lot here that could be reduced um, to reach that $2 million that, that I was referring to earlier. So if an override is not approved, if I mentioned, as I mentioned uh, just earlier, this is the fourth year in a row that we would be making reductions to what would have been a level service budget. So each year we're making reductions from the previous year's level service budget. It would be about $2 million in reductions. 
85% of that will be personnel. The school department budget is, is uh, personnel heavy, about 80% is wages. Um, the non-personnel expenses that we could make, they would be one-time cuts. It would be in, um, in some areas that you could do for one year and probably get away with it, but you would need the second year to, to bring those areas back. And I, again, I'm going to show you uh, what it could look like, what the scope of that could look like. Um, what we're looking at, um, if $2 million was reduced, is about $1.7 million would be in personnel reductions and $300,000 would be in non-personnel reductions. That's the equivalent of 30 to 35 FTE in personnel, uh, teachers, support staff, administrators. And certainly, which is probably the most important piece of this, any reduction of this magnitude is going to have an impact on student outcomes and student achievement. So this is what it will look like by level. Uh, again, this is a scope. Um, we have, we, we've tried to do is we've tried to stay general, but this is what it could look like if um, we needed to go through the reduction process of $2 million. Certainly, this is uh, something that would go through the budget process, um, which we do uh, December and January with the school committee. Um, and so what this, this, is, this is a snapshot of a potential uh, scope of reductions, which is primarily personnel. So at the elementary level, um, in which we did have classroom reductions this year, uh, it, we would be looking at approximately four to five classroom teachers. The impact of that would be an increase in class sizes at some grade levels. Uh, currently, right now, our class sizes are at grade K to 2 or 18 to 22. In grades 3 to 5, they're in the mid-20s, 23 to 25. Um, what we would see are those class sizes going in K to 2 to as high as 26 students, and in grades 3 to 5, as high as 28 students in some classes. And that certainly wouldn't be aligned with the school committee class guidelines, which were established right after the last override and redistricting had occurred in 2005. At, also at the elementary level, there would be a reduction of support staff. Um, these would be non-mandated classroom personnel support staff, and then the impact of that would be the level of classroom support provided to teachers and students would be significantly decreased. At the middle school level, uh, there would be an impact of uh, 10 to 11 classroom teachers reduced. Um, some of the impact, you'd see increases in class size across the board. You would see elimination of programs and course offerings that we currently have in our middle school. And it would also change the middle school interdisciplinary model, a model that has been very successful in our district for over uh, 25 years. It's a model that works for students of this age that are going through um, adolescence. Um, there's a lot of uh, support where, where students are connected to a group of teachers um, where, they're, where they're not falling through the cracks, which they're getting the support that they need, where there's a proactive approach um, with those students and constant communication with parents. So there would be a change in that model if, um, if uh, this reduction had to occur. In addition, you would see an impact in the vertical course opportunities or pathways as students enter high school because some of the courses that are currently being offered would not uh, allowed to be offered anymore, which means that those paths to high school, students would need to be starting those um, differently at the high school level. At the high school level, uh, we also had, as I said, reductions this year. Um, so this would be the second year in a row if these reductions were to occur. We will be looking at three to four classroom teachers. You would see an increase in class sizes. You would see a reduction in the number of sections available for a course, which means that students would have a more difficult time getting into those sections. Certainly that has an effect on graduation requirements, that students would be able to get the necessary classes needed um, uh, to fulfill the graduation requirements, so we would have to change the graduation requirements, which could affect then college placement in colleges that students would need to get into. At the district level, we'd be looking at um, one to two FTE uh, reduction in administrators. Um, certainly this would lead to a reduced support for 
other administrators, teachers, and families, but also we would see an increase in the workload of our building principals and school level staff. The non-personnel reductions, um, we would see uh, reductions in curriculum funding. Currently, we're in the first year of science curriculum implementation. Uh, there is a new framework that has just been updated by the, uh, by, uh, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Department of Education. Uh, this would put in jeopardy years two and three of that implementation uh, for FY18 and FY19. And so we would need to rely on either um, a free cash uh, reserves allocation outside the budget or uh, some other means of continuing that implementation. We would also see reductions in the materials and supplies uh, at the building level for classrooms and teachers. There would be less professional development, which is uh, something that's needed, particularly when you're making curriculum and instructional changes for students, uh, like in science. And then in technology, we'd have a delayed replacement of computers and less availability of technology for students in uh, grades K through 12. And as, as Bob mentioned um, about Killam, I do want to add that there are long-term challenges that the, um, the override does not address. One is Killam and the space needs um, and the renovation for Killam, but also is, is full day kindergarten. And we are quickly becoming one of the few school districts in the Commonwealth that do not offer tuition-free full-day kindergarten. Um, we do offer, we do have a tuition-based program. We have 75% of our families in it. Um, but uh, we're seeing more and more that surrounding communities and most communities in Massachusetts now have this as a norm, that um, families do uh, have their students go to full-day kindergarten. So now I think I'm gonna turn it back to you, right? Yes. Yeah, thanks. I'm going to f uh, finish my remarks with a similar uh, presentation on the town side and then close with a couple of thoughts that aren't on the slide. Um, <clears throat> for the $7.5 million override, the town is able to add almost a half a million dollars of either new things or restored cuts. I'm going to spend a little time talking about that first one. Um, we have a lot of the same issues as, as Dr. Doherty mentioned in retaining and attracting staff. In the last few years, we've had a number of employees retire after 40 plus years with the town. Think about that. It's not going to happen again. Um, one of the reasons it's not going to happen again is because 20 year olds living in Reading now, working for the public sector, cannot afford to live in Reading. There's a big difference than 40 years ago. So there was an in innate loyalty in employees that started with public sector 40 years ago that is not there today by geography. Um, our objective is that all of our employees perform in the top quartile by any measure, and that should be yours as well. Our financial objective is to pay them median or maybe just a little above median if we can, because we're not a wealthy community, we can't afford to do better. Uh, right now, the last uh, outside study we had, had our staff paid 7% below average of those peer communities. We have worked to improve that over the last few years. I'm sure it's less. But to ask uh, employees to work in the top quartile consistently and to be paid below average is a challenge. Um, hiring is a challenge and retaining staff is a challenge. Uh, this is especially true with the younger generation, which in, in uh, municipal government we see that more slowly than the private sector does for sure. Um, but the new generation that is coming along, when we do see them in some of our departments, um, it's a challenge to hire them and it's a challenge to keep them. And money is a more important factor today than it was 30, 40 years ago. So that's our number one goal. And honestly, the reason we're here this fall, as, as John and I had discussed uh, last fall, is, is we had two options to request an override. We could have done it in an April election next spring, or we could do it this fall. If we had chosen to do it next April, that means that two budgets would have had to be prepared for the winter, one if it passed and one if it failed. That meant a lot of employees would know that they might not have a job. The presentation from both John and I tonight are a little bit vague. Employees can't look at this and say, I know you mean me. But I'll tell you as an example, last spring, the town eliminated seven positions, six through attrition, one possibly through attrition based on a promotion. 
possible person waited two or three weeks after he found out and he found another job in another community that fast. He was not going to wait. Um, you know, retaining staff is a real challenge. The next couple of things we'll do are public safety. Um, a high area demand certainly is to add a second school resource officer, that's a police officer, and largely expand coverage in the middle and sadly the elementary schools. It's uh, becoming a national model. Um, we're actually staffed rather low for school resource officers compared to our peers, which surprises me. Um, many of the communities surrounding us have two or more. We have one. Uh, one another is the addition of a firefighter paramedic. Uh, being at the intersection of two highways, as the $800,000 of ambulance income suggests, they're very, very busy. Uh, we'd like to buy some technology equipment in the first year and then leave it open for the second year as to what might be the best use of it. It could well be technology staffing. We'd like a little flexibility. Uh, library staffing. The library has asked for a technology-based position for several years. We haven't been able to afford it. This would allow them to do that. Um, the town accountant is becoming increasingly overworked. Um, this would allow her to just hire some more part-time hours to give her a hand. And it's really important to note, and, and this is not well known, uh, that Town Hall supports, in addition to the schools for some things, it supports the light department. Um, all the bill roll and all the payroll goes through Town Hall. The town accountant and I must sign off on every expenditure by the light department. That's not an insignificant amount of work. They do a pretty good job, but we're keeping an eye on them. And lastly, it's, it's a bit of an unusual concept, but any of you that have volunteered and on boards and committees, what we have recently described as nighttime government, our nighttime government in Reading is, is world known. It's large and it's good. We don't have the daytime support, the daytime staff to support nighttime government as we'd like. Um, there are some boards that meet with no staff at all present. We'd like to fix that. We'd also like to give boards opportunities to do things with money here and there. So for instance, right now, our Council on Aging, our Human Elder Services are doing a master plan study at looking at the demographics, looking ahead, how are we staffed now, how should we be staffed five, ten years from now. A study like that costs money. We have to go scramble to find it. So this would be a, a small pool of money that would be available to all the nighttime government. In terms of reductions, again, I don't want anyone to quit tonight, so I'm going to be a little circumspect. Um, we have a $25 million budget on the town side. Uh, as Dr. Doherty suggests, we need to reduce that by a million dollars, four or five percent. Um, there's a list of possible reductions just pro rata by size of department to get to a million. Um, we spend money, we have a little bit more wage, uh, a little less uh, spent on wages, a little more as expenses than, than the schools do, we're 75-25. There's a rough translation if every department were cut by the amount of FTEs that 75% would suggest. We have 11 FTEs. Um, I have already issued a hiring freeze uh, a while back and there are currently three public safety positions and one public works commission position that are either vacant or soon will be through retirement that will not be filled until after the election. Um, I, again, I like to eliminate positions through attrition as much as possible. If those four positions were eliminated and we have to find another seven, it's going to be a lot of soul searching because we cannot combine and become more efficient anymore. Um, there will be services eliminated. And I don't want to even give any examples. At one of the meetings I said, for instance, if we got rid of all our tax collectors, and that seemed like such an absurd idea that I figured everyone would laugh, but our tax collectors didn't like it. So we won't be eliminating all of our tax collectors. Um, but the point is that um, this is a deep cut. We've, we've made do as best we can. You saw from the additions that we're not really looking to add back anything we've cut. Those weren't the highest priorities because we found other efficient ways to do some of the things that we've changed. Um, there's some new things such as a school resource officer we'd like. Um, and, and there's some things that aren't shown in that first year. Um, many of you, I'm sure, are aware that the Reading Coalition Against Substance Abuse, our CASA, is funded by a federal grant. We have one and a half FTEs currently, and that's for another two and a half years. Um, I'm quite sure that the community will want the, to continue after the grant runs out 
and make no mistake, we have got the maximum time and money out of that grant. In two and a half years, we're done. So we will have to find funds for those positions for one and a half FTEs. Um, you know, we do look ahead three or four years at a time. And again, with that three and a half percent annual uh, increase in the budget, if that becomes almost guaranteed instead of a real question mark every year, we know we can do other things with that, that amount of money. We may not need three and a half percent every year uh, to pay for our budgets. We will be able to add a person now and then, such as our CASA uh, staff member. And, I, and at this time, I do want to stop and mention a couple of other things. Both John and I have presented what I like to think are worst case examples. Um, there are other options. <clears throat> the selectmen could institute a trash fee. Sorry. <laughs> um, a pass board has said don't ever utter those words. Honestly, if an override fails, I think everything is on the table. Um, there are many communities, not so much around Reading, but in this state, and Reading could easily have a million dollar trash fee. And all of a sudden, all the things we've talked about are a million dollars better. Instead of a $3 million problem, it's a $2 million problem. But that's, that's money coming out of the taxpayers' pockets just in a different way. Um, right now, there's a $25 cost to park at the train station and also go to the compost center. If you park at the T uh, station and you work an average amount of days, 220 a year, you pay $880 to go to the train station. $25 is quite a deal. I'm not sure that will last if an override fails. So there are some fees, there are some revenues that could be imagined to come in that will make some of the things that, uh, that Dr. Dory and I have described to not be perhaps as difficult. Um, but the fundamental facts you know, are what they are. <clears throat> My last remarks, I want to talk more about the mechanics of the seven and a half million. Um, John has mentioned that currently the school deficit is, structural deficit is two million, and that's right and that another million is more or less is uh, some new additions. There's three million. The town has a $1 million structural deficit and we're adding half a million of new things. I think that's four and a half million so far. <clears throat> that's not seven and a half million. Why, what's, where's the rest? The schools actually have a $2 million structural deficit today, but over the next eight years, they have an additional $2 million structural deficit. If you remember that chart I showed, with the uh, lines diverging. The town has an additional $1 million structural deficit. So of the seven and a half million, five million will be directed at the schools over time and two and a half million to the town. And when I mentioned um, the idea of the capital plan, we can spend a lot more on capital early on when we don't need that money for the school and the town and then cut back in years six, seven, and eight when we need the money for the schools and the town and that'll even things out. But uh, make no mistake, um, you know, the schools have effectively a $5 million problem over the next several years, and the town has a $2.5 million problem, given what we've shown tonight. So that concludes our remarks. I'm sorry they did run a little longer than I expected, but that's typical. Um, for comments, questions, um, I would ask anyone to stand and walk down to a microphone. For those that are not familiar with town meeting, there's microphones at each uh, alley there each walkway. If you just come down, state your name and your address. It doesn't have to be the street number, uh, just the street name. That would be helpful. Um, and all questions are good questions. Go ahead. Uh, Brian O'Mara, Batchelder Road. I have a question for Dr. Doherty. Um, I hate to ask you to do this, but your, your slide, I don't know if it's possible to pull that back up, but where, if, if the override goes through, where that money So with these resources, how much of that is being restored? Are things that have been cut that's being restored? And how much of that have been improved? Because that is just to put this in context, it's not this override is being requested just because they want to do great new things that we want to do with the school. A portion of that is just restoring things that have been cut over the last three years, is that correct? That's correct. The um, health education and the high school positions, those, those are the two areas that are being restored from previous year's uh, reductions. 
Um, the rest of them are improvements. Specifically, the, the AP and electives in the high school program? Yes, yeah, the, the 2.5 hell, the 2.0 high school, um, those are restoration, okay. and the rest are improvements. Jeffrey Corn Ridge Road. I wanted to ask so I looked at the salary adjustment, three hundred and sixty thousand dollars out of a thirty-five million dollar wage budget, that's like a one percent increase in the average over like as well. The structural deficit of two million, if we went back three years to the things that we've been cut because we haven't gotten a lot of service budget for the past three years, what kind of a number does that look like? Do you know? Is that a, if we tried to look back four years ago? Over the last um, three years, I think we've reduced our level service budget by about $1.7 million. Um, I guess I guess the other point is all these tutors, I've seen some comments as well, parents should take the tutors, but these are some of the supports that are struggling with students that didn't support them, they would be IDPs and they'd be much more expensive. Correct. They potentially could go to special education, yes. Excellent. No more questions? <laughs> Ron? <laughs> we'll start with them. Start with Ron. Uh, thank you, Bob. Uh, Ron DiDario from Summer Ave. Uh, I got two questions. One is, was there any thought of including more than just seniors who might be in need, like uh, using the same criterion, but maybe there are single parent families who would fit all of the criterion except for age. And that, that's one question. And, and then the other question is uh, to our superintendent, to John. And, and that is John, we've been talking about, uh, you know, all day kindergarten, uh, paid kindergarten that people would have to pay for. And I know that's been before town meeting quite a few years and we've tried to do things and unfortunately they didn't work. But it would seem to me, you know, having uh, you know, young parents get in school paying like was it four or five thousand for that uh, how to pay or they have to pay. Yeah, forty two hundred. That isn't this maybe the time to to bring that in and kind of end it so that, and I, I just throw that out to you, you know, it would seem we're going to go through the difficulty of trying to get a, an override and it would seem that you'd like to put this issue away and, and bring it into the team. Thank you. Hi, good evening. I'm Jean Braski, chair of the school committee. Mr. Daddario, I want to thank you for that question, and I agree with you completely. Um, however, given a total amount of $2.96 million, our objectives were two. Number one, equity. We wanted to make sure that we didn't invest completely in one segment of the school population, but across the entire district. So if you look at this list, I think you will see that we have tried to make sure that there are improvements at all levels and for all segments of students, from those who are vulnerable with special needs to those who are higher achieving and, and probably have very grand expectations for college. You'll see that in like the high school AP elective offering. Also students in the general education population and the special education population. So one of them was equity. Um, the other was trying to impact as many students as we possibly could. So um, with, I think, 75%? 75% uh, of our kindergartners already enrolled in that program, admittedly at a very high cost. Um, full day kindergarten would impact a very small number of kindergartners, only 25%. Currently, it would cost upwards, I, I want to round it up and say a million, it's actually more like $900,000. $900,000, call it a million dollars to make that happen. So in order to have publicly funded full day kindergarten for every student in this district, which I agree with you, um, continues to be something we would very much like, we would have to take a million dollars off of this. And we just felt that these were too foundational and too important and address too many needs for too many students to cut. So that, but it was not an easy decision, no doubt about that. Um, um, the answer, Ron, is yes, we looked at a number of things. 
um, I'll describe some of them. <clears throat> the first uh, interest, if you will, of the selectmen and the staff were to protect those seniors, and it's easy to say the words most in need, and, and that's in the eye of the beholder, but especially those that moved into town quite a number of years ago, paid a lot less for their house than their house would be worth now, and all of a sudden their tax bill is starting to approach what they paid for the house in some cases. So to protect those that have been in the town for, let's just say, more than 25 years. I'm not that old, I'm 20 years. I better be careful what I say. Um, and, and that's where we started. And again, to protect those against the impact of an override, which was the first thought. Uh, as we looked around at the tools available to us uh, in the state, there were none. Uh, we have three articles going to town meeting that help the, the neediest 20 seniors. But there was a much larger group than 20 that were impacted by this, this other thing. So we had to create our new program, and there were two communities, as I mentioned, that had something. Um, the more complex and sophisticated you create a program, and it doesn't have to be called senior tax relief, we then need staff to administer it. Um, if you were to expand beyond what we did right now just to seniors and, and tinker with some of the uh, qualifiers to not be something the state has already approved, we need a full-time person. If you start to get beyond seniors, we need a second full-time person. Um, when you start looking at income and asset data, it's confidential data. It's not something you can outsource to a service to do for you. It's an employee you need to hire. So we did have other options. Um, but as usual, the most cost-effective way was to do what we settled on. Um, and you know, state tax, state income tax policy, for what it's worth, does have the senior focus on this, and it's acknowledged to be a growing problem in the Commonwealth. Most cities and towns are faced with this problem, certainly several in our area are, that it's the folks that moved into town many, many years ago uh, that are the most at risk. And, the selectmen and, and I probably had in mind um, the requirement for li living in town for 10 years or more, and our minds was much higher. But um, our assessor cautioned us that the state has to approve this home rule petition, and they would not likely approve anything that was longer than 10 years as a requirement, based on lots of other state law. I hope that answers it. Mark Pintora, Belmont Street, Massachusetts. A couple of clarifications and a couple of comments. Uh, one comment is we can't afford to modify our schools anymore, uh, or any less. Uh, I was informed by a friend that her daughter has close to 31 students in her classroom, uh, which is, God bless our teachers. Uh, they do a fantastic job. Um, but one thing I heard tonight was that the override will not be used to fund the library and the high school project, but I thought I read in the patch or the advocate that by law, some of that money has to be allocated to that. Is that correct? Uh, in a word, no. You know, we've already borrowed for those two projects. We must repay the debt service. And if you remember that little chart I had, we're paying 150 or $200 for each project for the next seven years or so. So that has nothing to do with the override, per se. The other comment I'd like to make is uh, both those projects had cost overruns. Um, and as well as um, there is ongoing litigation with the high school project. Uh, and I know that the Birch Metal Lighting Project, there was a budget of approximately 900000 uh, That got taken away to fund the litigation project. Whoa! So I, I have to stop, like to see I have to stop you right there. That that is not at all factually right. Oh, I read the, that. the Birch Meadow. Well, it must be right then. No. The the Birch Meadow lighting project was canceled because we didn't have enough money to complete it. It has nothing to do with anything else other than that. But then stealing Peter to pay for Paul. So I guess my point is these, these projects, the high school projects, great. Library is great, but I feel as though they're mismanaged. And the cost overruns are affecting our schools and everywhere else. And now we're looking at Killam that desperately needs to be redone. My kids won't benefit from it, but that desperately needs to be done for our, our future kids. Um, you know, it's, you're asking for more money on one side, but I'd like to see it managed properly and, you know, these costs control somehow. I mean, the taxes are through the roof right now. Um, let me talk a little about public construction, 
it's, it's not a pleasant subject. Um, <clears throat> several years ago, the schools did something called performance contracting that I mentioned. Uh, in so doing, we were able to go out and ask for bids, and by law, we did not have to take the lowest bidder. We could take the best qualified bidder in our judgment. That project was a home run. We picked the best qualified bidder that happened to be in the middle of the price range. They did a great job. For public construction by law, we must take the lowest bidder. In the case of a certain project that I won't mention from years ago, that bidder had a reputation for doing exactly what they did to Reading. And by law, we had no choice but to pick them or not do a project. There's a lot of problems with laws in this state on public construction. We do our best. I, I agree with you totally about uh, managing the projects, and we've actually made some very significant changes internally where we now have a permanent building committee that are looking at any new project, whether it's a school, a library, or town, and they are volunteers that are experts in the field, and they are in charge. So you'll not have someone like me making a decision like that. You'll have people that really know what they're doing. Um, having managed the library project for the last couple of years, I think I've aged 10 years. It's awful. Um, it's, it's a constant battle. It should have been done last spring. It's still going on. Um, as I stand here today, as opposed to three weeks ago, I can't tell you we might not need, need more money. If we do, I'll have to go to a town meeting and say that. But again, the lowest bidder won. Were they the best qualified? Is the ultimate cost going to be the lowest it could have been? We'll see. I just, it's the overruns and the some litigation in the past and being in the industry, um, what was my payment, um, getting into the prompt, new prompt payment laws and everything else. Exactly, and you probably can't say, but how much would we stand, do we could potentially lose and need additional funding in the future for this? It could just simply drive people out of town. Are you just another override in, for the library uh, or for the high school? Or? The, well, the high school. Yeah, that, that's, that's something we can't say. We, we have ideas in our head. We probably all have different ideas in our head. Mine's probably the biggest number because I always worry about things. Um, but I will say whatever the number is, it's manageable within our capital plan. Um, it's not something that's going to significantly change the quality of life in Reading. Um, it's a number. It needs to be paid. It needs to be settled. I wish it had been years ago. And the same with the library. Whatever it is, we need to take care of it and move on. Uh, neither of those outcomes will significantly change Reading and neither of those drive an, an override, quite honestly. Obviously, any kind of judgment ultimately needs to be paid. That's why we have free cash, for one thing. Thank you. Yeah. Hold on, hold on. Oh, sorry, please. Tom. <laughs> He'll be next after me, and I'll be free. <laughs> Thomas J. Ryan, and Daniel Bob, you have my no, that's the wrong one. It should be the other one. Good no doctor. Yeah, I think that's it. This one? Oh, first of all, I appreciate the fact that you people can try to work with these jobs together, but frankly, I don't care the you know, who what other communities are doing. And for months now, I've heard, how long will the override last? For the last five years, eight years? I have a little fire here put up at the Department of Revenue Division of Local Services. On page 16, it reads to the effect that the override is a permanent a definition of permanent that means lasting indefinitely. The permanent increase in the levy limit of a community, which is part of the levy, uh, very, uh, levy uh, base, increases at the rate of two and a half percent each year. Now we pass a seven and a half million dollar override, and the next year that seven hundred and fifty seven and a half million dollars will increase by $187,000. What I'm thinking of is uh, persons on Social Security benefits 
since the last override about 13 years ago, the persons on Social Security benefits received an average of less than two and a half percent. In fact, in three years, they got nothing. But next year, boy, are we in for it. We're going to get two tenths of an increase in Social Security benefits. I don't know what that means to other people, but when they <coughs> go to my favorite restaurant, I'll be able to buy a large prize. <laughs> <laughs> this evening, I had to help the flyer, and I hope that uh, there's this thing kind of there. I think I'll keep it, I'll keep it, I think I'll keep it. One of the things I said in the file is, we, this is the fine print, and way over here somewhere there's a little note. Now, the country trade on the 500,000 that uh, figure 8,355 represents. Yep. Uh, from the session uh, times, 1450, but then you have to subtract the exclusion of Gives us the exclusion for the high school and the library that's roughly $345. So, if you look especially at the $500,000 one, and you go across it, means next year, 2018, tax would be $7,872, or an increase of $967. Now, the options. Very simple. You can pass the override, dig deeper into your pocket, and tomorrow tell your employer that you need a 14% increase to take your own pay. Good luck with that. So, the other option, you can do what I intend to do, and that's I intend to vote no, because frankly, I can't afford it. Thank you. About the senior tax relief. Before I get to that, I have to get back to that TLT litigation because the last gentleman asked about a worst case number and you said you had numbers in mind and Dr. Doherty reported, said he reported to the auditors, we would need to be um, responsible for some number over three million at 12% interest going back to the date of the lawsuit. I went back to the date of the lawsuit, which is 2007, and Selectman minutes where there's letters from council saying we were sued for 4.7 million. So if I take that as a worst case number, at 12% interest for 10 years, it comes up over $13 million. And you're saying you can fit that within the levy limit and, or within our reserves. I've watched the past two FinCon meetings where you've discussed this and please just correct my understanding on this. You said, well, with that, I call it, you have the, the seven and a half million override and you described it as maybe being fortuitous that out of the capital reserves, we could possibly try to pay off the settlement in a few years. Is that correct? I'm a pessimist, but 13 million is not a number I have in mind, just to clear that up. Um, there has been a lot of developments in the litigation over the 10 years. Um, there's a master judge looking at things right now He's made some rulings for the plaintiff, some for the town, so we know that the upside or the downside is nowhere near that. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of my comment about capital, the simple way I look at this is, if the high school ends up costing, you pick any number, I don't even wanna say, more than it, we thought it costs, that's capital. It's a building. Uh, it should be paid for as part of the capital budget, you would think. Um, I should also add that we'll hasten to ask MSBA to reimburse a percent of it. They may, they may not, we don't know. Um, but what it does, if, if this is the way you approach it, is it crowds out other capital spending. Um, if it's a big number, whatever that means, we can't afford to just tip into our wallet of free cash and pay it, perhaps. We'll have to borrow for it, and you can do that under state law. Um, if we have to borrow three or four years in order to pay it off, we can do that. My comment the other night to FinCom was if, if it is a big enough number that we have to borrow, 
I would certainly want to borrow for as short as possible because I don't want to pay interest on top of all this. So if we do change our capital spending and allocate more in those early years and less in the later years, fortuitous is an interesting choice I made, but it is true that it, it is possible that we could throw a little extra capital funding at this as soon as we know in the early years or we don't do some of the capital that's otherwise planned or we just fit it in over the capital plan. Is it fair to say, and, and this is so perverse, but the override, using some of the override money to pay this judgment faster could save us money versus, my question is if the override doesn't pass and we have a judgment and you've got to borrow, it costs us more in interest, so it's, it's that, weird, but it, that might be where it works no, that, That's a very fair comment. I hadn't thought of it in those words, but you're exactly right. Um, if an override does pass, it's not that it's needed because of this litigation, but it would help reduce the cost ultimately of the litigation in interest costs for sure. Okay, thank you. That reassures what I heard. So my senior um, tax relief comments probably going to say most of them for town meeting. I've sent a memo to the Board of Selectmen and CC the school committee. I think it's a great moral thought that we're doing to have tax relief for the seniors. I question, um, I don't know whether it's trying to be an incentive to get to make the override easier for them, but I feel like there's only two communities in Massachusetts that currently offer it. They're much, much wealthier than we are. They have a much higher average income. I don't feel that this is the right time for it, but if we are gonna go that way, my question is, are we gonna test other ad, is it going to be a subjective test or an objective test for assets outside of income? Because there are seniors who own vacation homes outside of Reading, they have CDs, they have non-taxable state pensions. How are you going to determine how, how you look at the other assets to say who really deserves this? Um, this question came up at, at last night at Finance Committee and, and it's an interesting one. In any um, tax relief benefit, I'll say, it has to pass through and be voted on and approved by the Board of Assessors. Although our Home Rule Petition and State uh, Schedule CB does not have an asset test, the Board always has the right to have one on anything they, they judge. So it's, it's very much subjective and it's up to the three-person Board of Assessors to determine, wait a minute, you have a beach home down in Miami, um, we're not going to let you get past with this. But it, but it is a subjective call. It's not one they've made very often because, again, we've only had senior tax relief that have been impacting 20 to 25 seniors. They may, may well be tested, but that's up to them. The state has chosen for Schedule CB not to have an asset test. I don't know why. Well, I've, heard, I've heard rumors that even um, you know, retired state Senate President Folger with his $200,000 pension gets the circuit breaker relief. Really wow. It kind of makes us wonder. That makes me how it's going to work. Thank you. Yep. Uh, it's Ian McKendall. I live on Tennyson Road, and I want to address you all. Thank you. I work with the AARP tax program in Reading, and there's a lot of seniors who don't pay any federal income tax because they get 9000 a year. If they live in a house that's 500000 and they're going to be paying 7872 they're going to have $2,000 for the rest of their coming for the year. I think you need to realize most people are on Social Security. The first year I did that program, I was just going to do it for a year. But after I saw the need, and I do it in Reading, I do it in Wilmington, we did it at the Life Department, and that was a vital program. I can't tell you the number of single mothers who if it wasn't for the income uh, credit, the earned income credit they got, they wouldn't be able to afford to stay in their homes. So I think when you're looking at seniors and you're saying, oh, we're going to help them out. In my own case, yes, I have a federal pension and my husband does too, but we also lay out $4,000 And there are a number of seniors who are paying for their children's divorces, who are paying for their grandkids, who have children living with them. I don't think you understand the economic situation of most of the families who live here. So, but 
you know, I think it's a good idea to do this. I think 14% is way too high. And I think if you want uh, to have help, it's going to have to be lower than that. Thank you. I just couldn't let that comment go. Yeah. Nancy. <clears throat> Nancy Doctor, Pearl Street. I just have two questions. When you talk about the 25 communities you're comparing, do you know where Reading is in terms of assessed homes with those 25? Do you have that sense in terms of what we're... For the average single family yeah, home? Yeah, in terms of, yes, assessed homes, if you know where we are. I, I, I really don't, Nancy. Um, this is probably somewhere. I mean, this, this is the tax bill, so it's not um, quite the same, yeah, but... Yeah, this is the assessed home value. You know, we're, and maybe it's something for, for town meeting. This um, data is a little bit older, but, you know, a couple of years ago, when, which is the last data we have for the peers, tax bill was $6,600. You can see all these communities are paying more than that, and, you know, a lot of them are paying less. We're somewhere in the middle. In we're prob the, the we're probably the somewhere assessment. in the middle for assessed value as well as tax bills. And then the other question, this is about, um, I don't know about Wayland, but... Sudbury, I think, for their tax relief. I know that they thought they were going to have, similar to our number, about 250, 300, and they did um, an assessed value of homes as part of their criteria. Is that something that you're going to consider doing? Um, by using Schedule CB, uh, the state uses an assessed value limit of 691,000. So anyone, which seems high, anyone in a $692,000 home does not qualify for the program. And then the other question with that is that <coughs> they, at the time, I thought estimated um, about a $50 increase per 10,000 is what they thought the, you know, the increase was going to be passed on to taxpayers for the tax relief. Do you have any idea what it's going to be in Reading? I, I've not looked at it that way. I've, I guess we could probably figure it out from... One of these Let charts. Though. By the, I don't know what it was for Wayland. I thought Sudbury. You know, if the was, average single family home is paying seven thousand and this is eighty dollars, mm -hmm. you know, it's one percent. Okay, because they I know they wrote it out as fifty dollars per ten thousand for the Prob assessed homes. Of assessed value. Of assessed right. Values. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mark Agate in Street. First, thank you for the uh, very informative slides. Um, on one of the first slides, there was a number that popped out, and I'm wondering if you could, uh, understanding that allocated costs are already committed, can you explain the primary drivers to the 5.9% the increase in 2018 in the allocated costs? I can answer that in two words, health insurance. <laughs> um, in Reading, we have in the last five, six, seven years trended two to three percent below the national average. We've done that with a lot of hard work, and frankly, we've put some of that on the backs of employer, employees. Um, I don't think it's right to assume that we can keep being three, two, three percent below the national average. So I've used seven and a half percent forever going forward. Um, actuaries use eight or seven and a half, and they decline it usually to five. And I've talked to a couple of them and asked them why, and they say because the country will be bankrupt if it goes at seven or eight percent for every year. But that's been the trend. Uh, in the private sector for small businesses, it's double digits. It's clearly a, a thing that is not sustainable financially in this country. Um, so seven and a half, in one way, looks like a tame assumption compared to what it could be. But if I were to use 10, these numbers would be just crazy. Instead of a $6 million deficit, you'd have a 10. And it's hard enough to believe the six. Um, that's the biggest factor by far. Um, all the other costs, you know, some of them go three, four, five percent. That doesn't sound so bad. But again, our revenues are, are growing around three. Anything at a higher rate of growth than three is a problem. You know, what's energy costs gonna look like for the next 10 years? I think I guessed five. I don't know. Uh, out of district special ed, um, 10 years ago it was in double digits. It was 12, 15 percent a year. I guessed five. Don't know. 
Jim Riley, uh, Airplot Street. I'm new to all this, so I'm trying to figure out some of these things. On the way in, that older gentleman was passing out a uh, piece of paper. Could you explain to me what his document means with regards to the killing and the DPW exclusions? How is that going to affect and where does that come into that portion of the override or not? Sure. If you look at the top chart behind me, you'll see the library and the high school as part of a tax bill. Um, so the fundamental, if you will, tax levy is $6,900. Um, we built two large buildings that cost, um, you know, 20 to 50 million each. And there's the cost for the average home, $160, $180 a year, and it will end in those years that are shown. If we redo Killam, and if we follow FinCom policy and it costs more than about $2 million, which it will, we will need to ask the taxpayers to vote whether to pay for a new killum or not. It's really difficult to say how much that would add to a tax bill, um, but uh, you know, I could make up a number uh, and, and spread it over time, but it'd be in the order of magnitude of what you see here for these projects. Um, the reason the library costs relatively more is for the library we only borrowed for 10 years, for the high school we borrowed for 20 years. I don't like paying interest, so the library could have been much smaller for much longer if we had so chosen. Um, so kill them, you know, probably target $200 or less for the average home. The DPW garage is a little more complex. Um, we hope to do something and link that to economic development. If we could ever move the DPW garage from where it is, that's a parcel that could yield significant tax revenue. So that's one's a little more complex and, and isn't in the immediate future. I hope that helps. Oh, yeah, sure. Right now, there's nothing sinister going on with Killam. Um, that number is, that's, there's no such number. Oh, yeah, I see, five to eight million. Yeah, those, those numbers, those are Tom's numbers or maybe Bill's numbers, but those numbers I don't even know. Uh, five to eight million for Killam and 18 to 20 for, for two for DPW. No idea. Thanks. Hi, Harry Wheeler, Ashill Road. Um, I've been to some of the earlier meetings. Um, this is a new question. This building, I think, is about five to seven years old. Can this building be refinanced? That interest rates are lower now. Can this building be refinanced? Yeah, we did that um, four or five years ago, four years ago, and we actually saved taxpayers $3.6 million when we refinanced. And that wasn't 3.6 we could use on something else, because again, it's money outside the tax levy. So that's just 3.6 million that the taxpayers were never asked for. And then the uh, previous question from this microphone kind of led to my next question, which is, from the previous meetings on this, it seems the root cause of the problem is health insurance costs. And I asked this question earlier. I guess Reading is in a buying group of some other towns for its health insurance. No, well, yes, Maya but, is a nonprofit, true. But my question is the Commonwealth plan, the GIC, I think it's General Insurance Commission. Yeah. Has anyone. I, I asked this before, has anyone run the numbers to see if the town can save money by putting employees on the GIC? Um, we, we run them about every two months, honestly. Yes, we constantly look at that. Um, I have to be careful what I say politically here, but the GIC is not at a fair market price. Taxpayers are subsidizing it. If we could be sure the taxpayers would continue to subsidize it, it might be interesting for Reading. Um, right now, taxpayers pay between 50 and $200 million a year for employees' health insurance through taxes. So we don't think we have to be careful about that. We analyze it with and without that assistance. And without it, it's not a good choice at all. And with it, it's marginal. So, but the point is absolutely. And, and honestly, uh, a year from now, the, uh, the employees that bargain this will talk in September, October this year. It's on the table again for next year, absolutely. It's a possibility. It's a subsidy from like the general funds of Commonwealth of Massachusetts? Yes. Yeah, it does not run by itself at break even. It needs money from Beacon Hill in order to have the rates it has. 
and, and bear in mind, I'm really going to get in trouble now, it's insuring state employees. So if they didn't subsidize it, they'd have to pay it a different way. It's all state money. It's, it's in the state budget somewhere. So I, I'm assuming the, the money, the, the number that matters to us is the check that the town writes to the insurance company. That's correct. Yeah, and again, we have run 2 3% below uh, national averages. Um, our, actual, our actual costs for health insurance for the last seven years are below 5% a year, which you just don't find that in most businesses and most municipalities. We're doing the best we can. And that's, again, one of those things. Can I forecast that out? How? How can I keep thinking we're going to do that well? I don't know. Um, and just to follow up, we wouldn't have to be here if state aid would grow at 7.5% a year and health insurance would grow at 1.1, but it's reversed. Hi, Michelle Sampy, 75 Columbia Circle. Um, when I came in this evening, I was handed this piece of paper that you had on the screen a few moments ago. I didn't realize that it didn't come from the town or any of the elected boards. So I'm kind of confused because the Killam, 5.5 to 8 million, and the debt exclusion for DPW, the 18 to 22 million. I just want to make sure that those are not numbers that were run by a licensed employee member of the town. Those were run by. Let me just actually look. And individuals who don't know if they're factual. <clears throat> well, they're, they're definitely not from the town. Um, I'm just reading from the September 12th town meeting warrant. There's a new capital plan. Um, both those projects are listed in the capital plan. It says Killam Building Project, and the price is TBA. DPW Building Project, the price is TBA. So we haven't even informally assigned any kind of a value on those. We just don't know. It's too far away. Right. I, I really appreciate that. I'm also a member of Yes for Reading, and we've been trying extremely hard to only get factual information from our elected boards and from our town officials out to the public. So thank you for clarifying that. Certainly. I, I was going to try and stay quiet tonight for <laughs> um, the You better say who you are, Bill. Bill Brown. Uh, town meeting member for 49 years of residence. Uh, to answer the young lady's last question, the 18 to 22 million came as a result of a study done of the DPW garage down by uh, Weston Sampson a few years ago, and I believe the 5.7 million for the uh, Killing School was a figure that was given by the town several years ago. So they're not my figures, believe me. Hi, my name is Jennifer Hillary. I live on High Street. I'm also co-chair of Yes for Reading, which is a group advocating on behalf of the overrun. The financial evidence that we need this override has been made very clear to me tonight and from following the board discussions over the past couple of years. My question is not personal because I have faith from watching our town leaders work and based on the oath our elected officials have taken that you will act in good faith to make sure the priorities that you've outlined tonight come to fruition if an override passes. But what would you say to residents who say, how do we really know what the override money will be used for because it won't be earmarked on the ballot? They need to elect people to tell the truth. It's faith, it's confidence, it's no more than that. And quite honestly, if a ballot question were put out there, it specified exactly how the money would be spent. It's only good for the first year. Thirteen years ago when we had an override, I, I, I read about it a, a year or so ago, again, to refresh my memory. One of the things it promised in there was mosquito spray, but it only promised it for the first year. So it, seems, it seemed to the, to the selectmen, at least, somewhat disingenuous to make any kind of a list which really only had any impact at all for a year, and then you could do whatever you wanted anyways. So they thought, leave it up to the elected boards, leave it up to the finance committee, and ultimately, town meeting is the one that decides on how money is spent, 192 members. Hi, um, I just wanna to add to that because it's a good question. Um, we, we have in our community a kind of unofficial way that we approach the budget to 
create some stability between the municipal and the, the town, um, sorry, the municipal and the school side of the budget. And it's been that way for as long as I've been involved, which is heading it on 10 years now. And I you know it goes way back before that. Um, so when the, when the town manager and the FinCom start their budget process, they look at those accommodated costs that are highly volatile and really can change a lot from year to year, such as out of district special education, such as health insurance for employees, and they kind of pay those first. It's okay, we have to pay those, so just take them off the table, accommodate costs first. Whatever operating revenue is left is split roughly two-thirds, one-third. Two-third goes to the school, one-third goes to the municipal budget. Um, so with this override, if you've noticed, that's the split across the board. Um, it continues to be a two-third, one-third split of revenue. So the selectmen have used this as an opportunity to reaffirm their commitment to that split. So I think that's sort of another mechanism. It's not a policy. It's not a law. It's a, not a, even a guideline. It's sort of an agreement, the way things have always been done. And they have, the selectmen have, and there are two here tonight, certainly who want to speak further, have used this as an opportunity to reaffirm that commitment. So I think that's another kind of protection. There's a way of doing business. Everyone on FinCom knows it. Everyone on the school committee knows it. Everyone on the selectmen know it. That this is how we do it. Two thirds goes to the school. One third goes to the town. It's been that way. And this override is structured to continue that practice. Hi, uh, my name is Mark Doxer. I'm the chair of the, the finance committee. There are six of us here this evening. Um, just answering that question a little bit further, too, I wanted to make sure everyone understands the budget process that we do go through. So as the budgets are formed by the, um, the, town, uh, the town department heads, by the school department, superintendent, that goes forward to the elected boards. The elected boards review those budgets in detail, look through what's happening, and make sure they're comfortable with them. They take formal votes on them. It goes to the town manager town manager is responsible for putting together a balanced budget in total, and that budget goes to the Finance Committee. Finance Committee is charged with kind of going through all of those budgets, attending a lot of the meetings that all of the, uh, the boards have set up in the first place. We go through, we scrutinize that budget, we look at it, and basically we make sure that the town is getting you know, a good bang for its buck. We then make a recommendation in terms of that budget, sometimes with changes, sometimes as it is. We bring it forward to town meeting. Town meeting, then the 192 members go through that and have a chance to uh, review it, suggest any changes that they have. But I wanted to reassure you that each of these budgets is scrutinized very, very carefully. We're looking to make sure that we are getting the bang for the buck. And I guess I'd reassure you, um, from my opinion, we do get more than a dollar for every dollar that we spend, or more than a dollar in value. Thank you. Dave Reed, Lawrence Road. I've been in this town for about 10 years. Since I've been here, everything's just about doubled for sources of revenue, whether it's from my real estate taxes, my uh, water and sewer, or my life. Um, that all said, my salary has not really increased that much. I can count on one hand the number of raises I got from 2000 to now. So, in 17 years, I've had less than five pay increases just because of the way they counted. So, that all said, I'm not real excited to give the town more money. However, the foundation of bedrock of our community is our schools. So if you think of a community in this area or any area we grew up that had bad school systems, would you want to live there? I don't want to name names, but bad school systems precipitate other bad things happening in the community. So if our school system starts to rot out, everything else is going to fall. It doesn't matter how good our library is, how good our downtown is, if our school systems suffer, everything else is going to suffer with it. The reason our home values are what they are is because people want to move here for our schools. Uh, I grew up in Chicago. I moved out here in 98. I don't know much about this area, but whenever I mention Reading to anybody, the first comment is, Reading, good schools. So if we let that flounder, it's going to be a lot harder for it to get moved, whether it's Ripley to get back to where it was or get even better. So again, I don't want to give more money, but we got to find a way to make this work. That all said, I don't think our seniors should have to shoulder this burden. I think we need to find a better way to make, this, to make them agreeable to this, whether it's a lower rate that they go up or a better way that they don't have to shoulder this because they don't see any benefit out of this. And I don't blame them. If I were them, I wouldn't want to do this either. I, I want that guy to have something besides fries. I think I heard what he was saying. <laughs> um, so, Let's make this pass. Find a way. Dr. Doherty, put some skin in the game. Say, I'm not, I'm not going to take a, a salary increase for three years. I need to 
Anyway, <laughs> any way we can get this thing to pass, let's do it. Let's make this work. I don't know if you guys can do this or not, but if you're saying you can't earmark this past year, can we smooth this out? So is there any way you say we're just going to go over five years and we're going to put an extra increase over the five years so that way, I mean, I, I have the same fear that this is going to be, you know, it's an, it's an, it's an extra savings. And other groups are going to say, well, I need money. Let's just take from the, the extra money that we got out of the, uh, the tax increase. So can we do this over several years so we make sure that every year we get that in, we earmark it and send it to the schools? So maybe do a little bit more in year one so we can get that money out there and then smooth it out over the rest of the years. That could also make another way, and I don't know if this is possible, but another way to make this pass, so that way all of us don't see that big, huge sock in the gut one year, you see it kind of go a little more steadily or staircasing over seven years. But, so those are my two points. I, I want to see this pass, but to make it pass, let's figure out what our opposition are, and let's make them comfortable with this. Um, let, me, let me make two comments. Um, one I wouldn't normally make, but I will. I'm gonna, I feel awkward standing here, so I'm just gonna say Yeah, that's that. fine. <laughs> I know what it's like to feel awkward standing for long periods of time. <laughs> um, a real estate expert, I'll just say, that I was talking to two nights ago, um, was in the process of writing me an $850 check. He said, this is the biggest no-brainer in the history of the earth. And he recited much of the things you did. He said, this is protecting my home value, which is going to go up a lot more than $850 a year if you continue to manage the town at a high level, including the schools. Um, so I thought that was an interesting perspective. He didn't actually write the check, or I would have taken it, though. Um, and the other comment is, it's a philosophical question. You raise an interesting question. You can see on that chart behind me that Reading does not ask very often for an override. And when it does, it's a larger one. We could ask every three to five years for a smaller one. Is that right? Historically, that's not the way we have operated. I don't know that there's a right and a wrong. But we absolutely could have asked for a smaller amount and told you we'll see in three years. Um, our sense from the community historically is that's not what the community wants. It does not want to be asked very often. And in terms of um, not necessarily doing it more frequently, but using the money on a graduated basis, the selectman and I also discussed that. Um, again, state law requires you to pass a lump sum override. It does not require the selectman to spend all that money. <clears throat> the amount shown uh, for six million is this still on? Oh, my, my time is up. The, uh, well, I'll just shout. The $6 million that should last for eight to 10 years um, could have been done a different way. And that would have required a great deal of faith and trust in future boards of selectmen. We could have passed a, an override that was, you know, you pick a number, and then promised in the first year the selectmen will not assess all of that in the tax rate. They will leave you pick a number, $3 million on the table, because we don't need it right away. But eventually, we're going to keep going up every year as we need it. But the number would have had to have been bigger than $7.5 million. And then the promise was, we're asking for $10 million, but we're only going to need $6 million in the first year, $5 million in the first year. And then in the second year, we'll need six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Um, the total would have actually been bigger but the money out of your pocket would have been the same. It's just the town is doing the financial engineering, if you will, and smoothing it out over time. We're not asking you to do it. But there was a way to do that. But again, it did require a, a confidence in a future board that we don't know is, hasn't been elected yet to actually hold to a past board's promise and say, we will not allocate the full tax override that you have voted on. We didn't think that was good public policy. Just to clarify, instead of putting this to the ballot all the time, we can just put the ballot once and say we're going to do a 5% increase in year one. No, uh, that would be great. <laughs> no, I, I've asked our state legislators, can we just pass Prop 3 instead of Prop 2 and a half locally? I was shown the door. You've hit exactly on the problem, though. The problem is there's a little increment, there's a little escalation that we need each year. We could ask for the structural deficit of $3 million, the additional funds of a million and a half, if we could then increment that faster than two and a half over time. We can't. That's just not legal. It would be great. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's a battery died. Oh. <laughs> Hello, I'm April Merthrup. I live at 45 Catherine Ave. 
Um, I'm just wondering, um, and this had come up at um, one of the community listening sessions, um, a breakdown between um, residential property taxes and commercial property taxes. Um, could you refresh our memories, please? What is the residential tax rate and what is the commercial tax rate, please? Sure. Um, right now in Reading, they're each $14.51 per $1,000 of assessed value. So we have what is called a uniform tax rate. Actually, the chart I had has a little more information. Um, that column I didn't discuss previously that says split. Um, the yellow communities under split are the ones that have the same tax policy as Reading, more or less. Um, the ones not in yellow are ones that tax commercial more. So for instance, looking at the top to the right, Wakefield, um, has a commercial tax rate twice as much as their residential tax rate. But I'll stop right there because it's really important that everyone understand Prop 2.5 still works on the total. This is rearranging uh, the tax levy. It is not increasing. So if we were to increase the uh, percent or the taxes on our businesses, the residential would go down. It doesn't change the tax revenue. And that is something that the selectmen uh, consider every November. I, I hasten to say argue about every November. Um, and I'll, I'll summarize kind of the linchpin of the discussion. There has been a split vote on this, no pun intended, for years. Um, those that are opposed to doing that, broadly speaking, say there's not enough commercial in town to make it worthwhile. So right now the ratio is about 92% residential, 8 commercial. So for every dollar that you're saving a household, a business is paying $12, or whatever the ratio is, as opposed to if it was one-third, two-third, the household saves a dollar, the business only pays $2. So that's been the philosophy, if you will. And again, that, there's no right answer to that. That's clearly a philosophical choice. Hi, I'm David Corey, Upper Street, uh, I've been a resident of Reading for about 15 years. And one thing that I have said, I, this is more of a comment than a question. Um, one thing that I have said for the entire time that we've lived here, and it feels silly to say about your town, but I, I have always felt like Reading is a good value. <clears throat> when I talk to other people that I know that live in other communities, what we pay for taxes versus what we get, I've always felt has been a good value. And when I hear numbers like, you know, we're in the bottom half of what we pay our teachers. Um, when I hear things like we are paying, you know, below the, the curve on taxes. Uh, when I hear things like we're, we're already um, below the, the escalation rate on health insurance, which is a, a huge cost. Um, that all says to me, that we're already doing a lot to maintain Reading as a, a value community, just to keep using that phrase. Um, I am, I think, like a lot of community members, probably a lot of community members who aren't here tonight, that I'm not involved in town government. I haven't been. I, you know, I read the papers and I vote and all of those kinds of things. Uh, but I'm not on any boards, uh, so I'm, I'm, maybe I would describe myself as a passive resident. Um, but I have been able to do that because I feel like the people that are on the boards and the people that are our elected officials and whatnot are doing a good job and maintaining Reading's place in my mind anyway as a value community. So when our elected officials and board members or whatnot are coming to the community saying, we need this, I'm inclined to say, yeah. Uh, I also have 
some involved, my, work, my wife works in our school system, and so I see a little bit of that from the inside. And, uh, you know, I agree with what the previous question on the side said. The schools are the bedrock of what brings value to the community and why people value the community. And when I see the performance of our schools over the last 15 years compared to statewide averages, we, I think, punch above our weight. Um, you compare that with what we're paying our teachers, and again, it speaks to value, right? We're, we're not paying our teachers very well, and that's having problems. Um, and, but we historically have gotten better results you know, than statewide. So I fully support the waiver ride. Um, when you were showing the table about you know, six million to nine million, and this goes to I think some of the earlier questions about wouldn't, want to, wouldn't you want to wrap in um, full day kindergarten? My mind went to why are we not talking about eight million, eight and a half million? Uh, because it's been 13 years. Clearly, Reading is out of practice for having override requests. When you look at our peer communities, and some of them request overrides, you know, have requested overrides 20, 19 times, 14 times, 15 times. Um, we've only done this five times, so we're not used to having these kinds of discussions. I think, um, but I think it is well overdue that we're having this conversation, and I hope to God this passes, because I think without it, the community is going to really go down. Uh, and um, I certainly appreciate your compliments from those, uh, but I will say there's, there's one thing we don't do well, and, and I'm the worst offender. Uh, we don't complain, and we don't reveal to the community the true cost of what it takes to run the schools and the town. Um, we've discussed a lot of it internally. Everyone up here is very familiar with everything we're talking about. But we don't go out to the community, go to the coffee shops and say, do you realize the value you're getting? You should be paying a lot more in taxes. We do that only as a last resort. That's probably not the right answer, because then everyone isn't used to the discussion. It, that many people have moved into town less than 13 years ago. They've never been asked before. Some of the other towns that ask every two or three years, you get used to it after a while. So it, it is an interesting philosophical difference. And I would say the, the area we've fallen down is not being much more vocal to the entire community that this is not easy on the money you're giving us and it's going to take you know, some time. Um, we could have easily come for an override five years ago and a smaller one and then have to come in a couple more years and again, that's a style question. You know, that's something we, if, if the voters wish, we certainly could do it more often. In the long run, again, our sentiment is let's not, let's not bother the voters too often, and that may not be the right approach. Uh, Amy Cole, Bart at Starkville. I'm also a member of Yes for Reading, so I fully see the need and support um, in override. And uh, mine might be more of just a short comment as well, but you can correct me if I'm wrong. My fear, <laughs> if the override did not go through in October, is that once we actually feel the full brunt of the impact, more people will get informed, um, you know, they'll have no choice, and this would come to the table again. So I would see an override eventually going through at some point. Um, my understanding is that with the same amount of money at that point, we would get a lot less. That if you had, let, had to let go of 50 employees, that the cost of rehiring, retraining, um, reinstating programs is going to far surpass what we're looking at here and that they would not get as much. I just want to kind of confirm that. Uh, I'd say that's generally a, an accurate statement. Uh, if we're here a year from now and an override has failed and we're talking all over about it again, I would almost be certain that the number's higher than seven and a half million in order to accomplish the same objective. Maybe it's eight million, maybe it's eight and a half, probably not too much more than that, but you're right. Um, Jeff Hoffman, Reading Community Center. Um, I've been in town for over 30 years. I uh, live on Pearl Street, had four kids go through Reading Public Schools. My youngest graduated this year. 
Uh, so my kids were in school when the last override failed and we had to go back at it again. And so there's some cost, it's financial, it may cost us more, but um, you know, there's a cost that's inside of you, that's in your heart, that's as you watch the teachers struggle, as you watch the kids struggle, and as you know, you never get that year back. We'll come back here, and we'll do the budget again next year, and we'll think about an override next year. But the kids go from kindergarten to first grade, third grade to fourth grade, ninth grade to 10th grade, they graduate. They graduate maybe with not everything they wanted on their transcript. So that's a cost that is really hard to measure. And I've been accused of being too passionate about this. And I realize it's because it get, this is like very visceral for me. And I, I've thought about it and I said the only solace that I have, my own children won't actually be affected. You know what, that's a cruddy solace. Because all of your children and the children that I said I would be responsible for, ensuring that they get an absolute best education they can, will be affected. I don't want to see that again. I, really, talk to people who are 50, 52, 53. Talk to the mothers who were home, because at that time, only 25% of the kids were in full day kindergarten. 75% were at home, half day. It was mostly mothers. Maybe there were some dads, but it was mostly mothers. We were in the classrooms because the teachers had 30 kids. My son, Nancy Sweeney, 29 kids in the class. There were no paras. There were mothers. There was a schedule, two hours on. We paid for babysitting for other children so that we could volunteer in the classroom. So the cost, but the damage that gets done, because our teachers, we undermine everything that they're here for. You pull the rug out from under them. They don't know if they should be able to stay here. You think about it in your own life, work life, when there's layoffs and downsizings and shutdowns and, boy, does it stink. You don't know that you can stand in one place and give it all. And we ask our teachers and our town employees to give it all and more every day. So, I'm, I'm obviously not going to stop being passionate about this because it hurt too much. It hurt too much. I have nieces and nephews in this town that I certainly don't want to be affected. Don't do this to the kids. combination of raising residential uh, and commercial property taxes in addition to raising some fees. I mean, I've lived here since 2000 and the dump fee sticker and resident parking permit has remained at $25. Um, could that go up some? What about paper growth for trash where you um, pay less if you recycle more? Sure. Um, <clears throat> by, again, by state law, fees must only cover the service that you're providing. So for instance, for a trash fee, if people were willing to pay $10 million for it, we couldn't actually charge that because it doesn't cost $10 million to collect the trash. It costs somewhere just under a million. And for the depot, that's a little harder to say what the intrinsic cost of that is. Um, but if we were to raise the fees and the selectmen would agree to that to some figure that's not $800 a year, um, we're talking about maybe a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars. So the the fee options available to the town and the schools are quite limited, given the scope of the imbalance, if you will. Um, but there are a lot more fees today than there were 13 years ago. But I just hope that people will keep that on the table because um, I think that what I was hearing at the listening session I went to, and from people I've spoken with, people are very committed and want to commit funds to the schools uh, and. The uh, don't want uh, to have teacher cuts, but it's very important that um, the priorities, um, in my case, my priority is classroom teachers above everything else um, for school spending. Um, so I want to make sure that 
uh, that's how it will be spent. And also, that the overriding um, request is it's so large that it, uh, all we have a choice to do is vote yes or no on this. We don't have a choice of voting yes on a smaller number or a combination of um, fees and property taxes, and that's kind of a shame. Um, in terms of, let's just pick on the trash fee and let's just pretend it's a million dollars. We could have asked for a seven, or sorry, six and a half million dollar override. It's the same money. Um, then the federal government isn't our partner anymore in terms of writing off the t property tax bill on your federal income taxes. So there's a real advantage. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, Winchester, several years ago, was doing some significant water improvements. And they decided to move the debt out of the water enterprise fund onto the tax levy for this exact reason. Um, it saved their taxpayers, they estimated, half a million dollars a year of income tax. So there's an intrinsic advantage for anyone who itemizes to have an income tax deductible expense and a trash fee would not be. Thank you. Hi there, I'm um, Greg Schultz, uh, Hartshorn Street. Um, I just want to encourage you guys, I, I believe that that's a very good faith to try and uh, trim the budget as much as possible. But I encourage you to try and think outside the box in ways perhaps you have to borrow. I can give you an example. About four years ago, Heart Street was repaid. paid. Uh, we didn't really fail at the it, but we were very appreciative of what it was done, certainly. Um, but we weren't really given much notification that it was coming. Now, fast forward four years later, I can think of four or five areas where people have broken into the street to convert over gas. Um, the Patches that were put in were done very poorly. Uh, each one of them was sinking, the seams have opened up, and now a road that should last X number of years is going to last significantly less. All for one, a little bit of the vacation, so people could have done this, could these conversions uh, before the road was redone. And it's just one example of that. I can answer that one because there's no bigger frustration from our side as the example you gave. If you can ever talk to the gas company and ever get a sensible answer, you'll be the first one. Um, we communicate with everyone who might dig up a street two or three years in advance and lay it all out. Invariably, now sometimes a water main may break, you can't do anything about that. Invariably, the gas company comes along in a year or two later and digs up the street. And we have actually thought and talked with our, with our legislators of a home rule petition to really penalize them for that. It's not a politically acceptable thing on Beacon Hill. Their lobby's strong. Um, but you're absolutely right. Anyone that digs up the street does not put it back in the same condition that it was if it's old or if it's new. Um, again, there's nothing worse than having a street paved and then having it dug up by someone else. But I will say in the last two years, they've improved. Um, one would hope that at least the town can coordinate its water sewer planning with paving, and we do. Uh, all of a sudden the MWRA might come along and they had a certain plan to go up a certain street and they hit ledge and now they change to another street while those things happen. Um, so we do as much planning as we can, but in terms of notification, again, we're not usually the employees doing the paving. Um, this summer was particularly aggravating because streets would be half paved or West Street had those monstrous manhole covers raised and one would have thought I drive across West Street every day, so I was particularly annoyed. Um, one would have thought paving would follow, but not three weeks later. The contractor had another job to do and just disappeared. Um, if it were town employees doing this work, it would have been done the right way. Um, it's a never-ending frustration to deal with outside vendors that have lots of competing needs. We kind of do the best we can. Um, I, I will say that for the first time, and I've said this at, at recent meetings, We've done so much road work in this town, we finally now have a list of please don't pave my street. We always had the opposite. I can think of another example. Several years ago, we got notification that you were going to be removing all of the uh, schools on flashing lights because they were malfunctioning and they weren't worth the price to repair. Um, people fly through the school zones now. And uh, you know, I, I think about the, the decision made there, but then I drive around and I see dozens of uh, fire station poles, which certainly cost something to maintain. I'd be curious to know how many of those have actually been used over the years to report fires, which everybody now is a cell phone. Is it worth keeping those up? I don't know how, how it would save an awful lot of money, but it's just every little bit counts. If I pick up 
Penny's office, to give him the sun, and every little bit counts. And he puts it into his bank, and he collects a lot of money that way. Every little bit counts. Yeah, I agree that every little bit counts. Um, I'll ask the fire chief, is that a requirement that we have every so often at every so distance of fire pull? one thing I, I didn't really emphasize enough um, whatever state uh, whatever town meeting approves needs to go through the legislature and get approval and the governor and the legislature parenthetically on tax policy includes the DOR the Department of Revenue uh, I'll give a lot of credit to Sudbury who was the first one through 
the, the first one that passed senior tax relief. Um, they still have the scars on their back from DOR to prove it. Right now, it's not legal to have non-senior, if you will, tax relief, to have just based on income. Um, that doesn't mean we shouldn't try and shouldn't be the first community. Right now, no communities do that in the Commonwealth. It's not considered legal. I can't really say illegal because there's no law, but it's not approved by the DOR. But to your point, we could certainly be the first if we so chose. Um, anyone up in the back that's been awfully quiet? <laughs> okay, well, thanks very much for coming. Uh, for those of you that are or know a town meeting member, September 12th is the next important date. And then please, no matter what opinion you have, October 18th is when you get to express it and vote. Thank you.